Welcome back to Learning with Merit. Today, we are going to cover the Linux command line interface, keyboard shortcuts, navigating the file system, creating, reading, updating, deleting files and directories, searching, checking the disk space, and of course, basic process management, while we are also going to cover other basic necessary commands for dealing with the CLI. Let's talk about the Linux command line. So of course we have the console, which is our physical device. It's going to be like our keyboard and monitor. And then we have the command line, which is our text-based interface that allows us to interact with the computer by typing in commands. And of course it's much older than the graphical user point-and-click mouse type interface. We have the shell, which is our program that interprets our commands and uh, points out uh, or provides output to the user. There are multiple shells that can be used in Linux, but the default one we're going to use is Bash. And the Bash shell or Born Again shell is also a language, a programming language, that was written for the GNU project, which is a part of the Linux operating or the GNU Linux operating system. So it's um, also used for shell scripts. And shell scripts are basically little programs that do things because Bash is also a programming language that you can use as well as the command line interface that we are going to work with. So terminal is going to be the little program we're going to use. We're actually in a terminal right now. It's what's displaying this text to you. And then we're going to have a prompt as we did in Windows that tells us, hey, the computer is ready for us to take um, commands. And of course, this time we're going to see a little dollar sign. Now we typically have the following parts, just like we did when we worked with command prompt in Windows. We have a command name, we have flags, and we have arguments. And of course, the command is the actual command we want to execute. The flags and arguments are going to be optional, depending on the command. Flags typically change the behavior of the command, and arguments in a lot of, a lot of times are things like files that you are providing to the command to do specific things. Now that we know what the command line is, and we've talked a little bit about what we're going to use, we need to understand how to actually get to the command line. So one of the ways that we can actually get to the command line is to use a keyboard shortcut. Now, the easiest way to get to the command line for most people is just going to be to come down here to the taskbar, and you will see the terminal emulator here. We have a little tool called the terminal emulator, and it pops up just like that if you click on it. But maybe it isn't um, right down here whenever you access your new fancy Linux distribution. The other way you can do it, in most Linux distros, Control, Alt, and T will open up the command line interface for you. So remember, that's Control, Alt, and T all together. And you don't have to hit them exactly the same time. You can hold Control, then Alt, then T, and it will open up. Now, you can make the terminal a little bit bigger um, by hitting Control, Shift, and then the button that's plus. So basically it's control plus, but you have to hit shift to get the plus to uh, work. So it's control and shift and plus on this. So once you get this open, there are uh, several tabs up here at the top. And you can sort of change the size of the window if you want. You can reset it. Um, there's also help like about, for example. So here we can see what type of terminal emulator we are using. So this is the genome termi uh, terminal. And it is a terminal emulator because things are all fancy these days. It's not an actual terminal. It's a terminal emulator um, for the genome desktop environment, which is um, what Cinnamon, I believe. Cinnamon is the desktop environment for uh, the current version of Linux Mint, and it uses pieces of the genome desktop environment. So now that we know what kind of terminal we're using, of course you can see the different version and things like that. You go look at the website. That's what help is going to show us as well as some. You click on contents. It's going to take you to stuff like this where you can get some help with your terminal, like customizing the appearance and behavior uh, and things like that. And most, most Linux terminals that I've worked with uh, have something similar to this. A lot of, Genome is a very common one to see used. We also have search. So we have find for things, control F, like we all know, except if you look in this particular case, it's shift control F. 
we have view, so we could show the menu bar or we could get rid of it and then suddenly it's not there and now we don't have the menu bar to work with. If we need to get the menu bar back, we can right click anywhere in the terminal and you will see the little show menu bar and it's back. Of course we can make it full screen, it shows you how to zoom in and something else that's always important, um, if you take a look here you will see that oftentimes they give us keyboard shortcuts for little things like this. So here in view we can see how to zoom in, zoom out, how to return it back to its default size. There's a little button for full screen but of course you can also hit F11. Um, here in edit we have copy, copy as HTML. We're going to talk about HTML in the future. It stands for hypertext markup language when we are dealing with web pages and how to create them. And then we have um, how to paste. Of course you'll see it's different. We have shift control C and shift control V whenever we're working in the terminal for copy and paste. We have select all. We have preferences. So if you want to change things about the terminal like the colors for example that's how I went in and changed the colors on mine is I went from uh, what it provided me which was the it's it's used colors from system theme and check that and then I was able to change the default colors that I wanted to do there as well and of course there's several different things here but we're not going to go through um, every one of these um, you can look through them yourself if you'd like to and mess around with them there's plenty of different things to find out there and then of course we have file, we have new tab, new window. You can of course create a new tab with shift control T, a new window, shift control N, close it with shift control W and close the, uh, sorry, close the tab with control, shift control W and close the window with shift control Q. So lots of different keyboard commands and of course as you get more fluent with Linux um, and you're working with it more and more, you would um, eventually learn those commands pretty much by heart because you're using them so much and I will tell you that while point and click is easy and terminal seems hard the terminal is ultimately faster once you know what you're doing in the beginning it seems sort of stupid like why would I do this I don't really need it but later on whenever you're able to string you know several commands together because you know what you're doing, it takes you, you know, easily a tenth of the time it would have taken you to do that if you were working, you know, got to click here, got to click here, got to click here. Let's take a look at some keyboard shortcuts. So we already know how to open the terminal. Um, in this case, we have a few basic navigation things we can do. Control C is to stop whatever is currently running. Control D will log you out. Control Z is not undo. It is suspend a process. Okay, if you get caught in that, you need to hit FG to get out. Um, control L is to clear the screen. It's a, an alternative for clear. The command we'll learn later. We have control A to move the cursor to the beginning of the line. Control E to move it to the end. Control U will delete from where the cursor is at to the beginning of the line. Control K will delete from where the cursor is at to the end. Control Y is our way of pasting. So we basically cut with Control U and Control K, and Control Y allows us to paste that. Tab is our autocomplete. Then we have up arrow and down arrow to access uh, previous commands. Control R will let us search through our command history. Exclamation point, exclamation point will let us rerun the last command. And then exclamation point and a number will run it, let us run the nth command. So um, nth basically meaning that number. We also have control T to swap the last two characters before the cursor, control W to delete the word before the cursor, and then alt and period to insert the last argument from the previous command. So let's look at a couple of these. First of all, control, control C is pretty easy. It just stops whatever you're doing. Control D would log us out, so I don't really want to start there. Control Z is going to suspend a process. So if I did this, so this is a command to um, edit text files. So I'm going to type nano and then file.txt and it will create file.txt. Now, if I hit Control Z, well, in this case, it doesn't like it. But if I hit, let's see, that should be, if I do that right there, it says, it's, it's put it in the background, right? So what we're dealing with is 
I need to hit FG to return back to that process. All right. So if I hit FG, it returns back to that process. See, I go right back to it. Right. So I'm going to actually get out of that correctly this time. Now we have some other commands. So if we look up here, we have Control A. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna type uh, sort of a uh, lengthy command here. So if I did um, sudo apt update and let's see and sudo apt upgrade dash y. So that's kind of a lengthy command right there. And it says, we want to. I need to move the cursor to the beginning like I messed up, right? I didn't type sudo correctly for some reason. If I hit Control and A, it takes me to the beginning of the cursor there. If I hit Control and E, it takes me to the end of the cursor. If I need to delete from where I'm at to the beginning of the line, so let's come over here. I'm going to say, I need to delete from here to the beginning of the line. I could do Control U. If I need to put it back, I hit Control Y. If I need to uh, cut from where I'm at to the end, I hit Control K. Again, if I need to put it back, I hit Control Y. So I have a way to uh, copy and paste and do all of those different commands. Now, um, tab autocomplete. So I'll go ahead and I will hit um, Control U, get uh, rid of all of that. If I need to autocomplete something, so let's say that I'm trying to um, go through a lengthy process. Let's say I'm trying to change my directory to root, and then, I don't know, let's see, I want to go to Etsy somewhere. So, But I don't really know where to go from there. I can hit Tab, and it says Display All 144 Possibilities. So there are 144 different directories in Etsy. Let's, uh, let's hit No, and let's see if there's anything that begins with an A. So there we go. So those are all the directories right there that I could possibly get. And what you heard me doing is I hit tab tab. So tab tab is going to give me a list of the different autocomplete possibilities. So I need to create, I need to add a specific enough um, piece of text that it can figure out. So let's see if we can find uh, one that's pretty easy. Let's try APT. The problem with APT is that App Armor and apparmor.d and apm all pretty much are the same so if i try to if i try to autocomplete apt i'm still left with all of those possibilities but maybe if i wanted to go to acpi here maybe if i wanted to go to that that one's actually pretty easy i just say ac and hit tab and you see that it auto completed for me because it is um, by itself enough what if i wanted to go to alternatives i, I Alt and hit Tab, and you see it makes it really quick for me to actually move around the command line with that autocomplete. So don't don't waste all your time typing. If you know what you're looking for or you can see it, um, just use Tab. It will help you out a lot. Let's say that we're going all the way to the directory that we're currently in. If I go from here and I start to type Home, and I hit Tab, it autocompletes. Then my user, there's only one user, LWM in this case. And then maybe my desktop. Now I have multiple things that could be my desktop. So I'll type desk and then tab. And then there's only one folder that's even close. And so you see, I didn't have to type out all of that. I just hit the tab key. Now we've got some other things if I want to go, to go through my history. So if I want to go through my different commands, here I'm pressing up arrow to cycle through all of my previous commands that I've done. I'm using the down arrow to go back through them as well, eventually back to where I'm at. If I hit Control R, it will allow me to search through my commands. I'm going to search for that nano command. So there's my nano command. I just typed nan, and it found the nano command for me. If I want to rerun my last command, I can just hit exclamation point, exclamation point, and you'll see that it was, let's see, it was FG. So let's type something else maybe. Let's try, uh, hmm, let's try cat. Cat's a good one. So I'm going to echo some text. Hello, world. I'm going to send that text to a file.txt. 
just like that. And then I am going to cat that file. So this is going to read the text out to the command line. See, there we go. Now, if I want to rerun that command, I just hit exclamation point, exclamation point, hit enter, and it tells me when it's running first, and then it runs it. So it echoes the command out to the terminal, so you see what command you're running, and then it runs it. Now the other one is exclamation point n, but it's not n, it's a number. n is just a variable that represents the number you might be using. So if I did like, I don't know, exclamation point 4, okay, it cleared the screen for me. So it looks like I ran clear at that point. Let's cat, let's see what we've got in our ability to read out files. We've got several different things here. Let's look at um, the keyboard shortcuts again. So I need to type Linux CLI dash K and then I can tab complete. There we go. We've got them back up. We've got three more we need to do. So sh uh, swap the last two characters. So I'll do A, B, C, D. And then if I hit control T, you can see that C and D are switching back and forth. And then if we need to delete the last word, so if I do a space and do um, E, F, G, H, um, it basically delimits, so a, de a delimiter is basically the thing that is separating the two words, and the delimiter here is a space. So if I hit um, Control W, it deletes the last thing. Okay. And if, for example, I did cat file.txt like this, the last argument is file.txt. Now hit here. If I do um, echo, and then I was to hit alt period, you see that it, it um, inserts the last argument from the previous command, which happens to be file.txt here. So these keyboard shortcuts are super useful to you when you're navigating around on the command line, especially the tab autocomplete and all of the different ways you can move your cursor because uh, I promise you when you get longer commands using your little arrow keys can be really irritating just sitting there waiting. So let's take a look at our commands that we have from the command line here. So our basic commands. First, we're going to look at compgen-c. That's going to be a list of all the commands we can execute. We'll look at the man command for looking at documentation for a specific command. Who am I, which displays the current user. PWD, which prints the working directory. LS will list the files. It's not DIR. It's LS in Linux. CD will change our directory. MKDIR will, change, will create a new directory. RMDIR will remove our directory. Touch is how we will create an, a new or empty file. RM is to remove files. CP is going to copy files, so we would do CP and then the path to where we want it to go. We've got MV. MV is for move. You can also use this to rename files. There's not a separate command for renaming. Then we have some redirect uh, little commands, depending on what you're using here. These are angle brackets, so we've got one that redirects the output of a uh, output to a file, one that redirects output and appends to a file. Of course, you can read all of these. Some of these we will use today. Some of them are a little less common, and we won't go through today. We've got cat to display the contents of a file. We also have less. We also have head. We also have tail. These are all different ways for us to actually look at the content of a file and I'll show you how to do that today. We also have some searching commands like grep and find. Grep is a super useful command you'll use all the time. We have df and du. These are different ways that we will look at disk space so we know how much is on our disk, in this case meaning our storage. Then we have some process commands like ps, kill, and top. These are for dealing with processes, and top is sort of like your command line version of the uh, of the task manager from Windows. And then we have a few other commands here: sudo, chmod, chown, tar, and wget. We are going to use all of those today to take a look at some different things. 
So let's just go ahead and get started here. We need to understand how to move around and navigate the command line. So I'm going to clear this out. That's our first command we need to learn that you notice wasn't, wasn't listed there, but clear is going to clear your command. And I am going to go ahead and change my directory back to my normal home directory. So here we have our prompt. Our prompt in Linux is just a little different, but it still has the same parts as it did when we talked about Windows. So here we have the user at, and this is the name of the machine. So it's your user at the name of the machine, and then you will see a colon, and then you will see the file path. Right now the file path is just a little squiggle called the tilde, and that represents our home directory. So the directory for LWM, that's where we are at right now. And that is a little uh, sort of relative file path thing. And then of course we have the dollar sign to indicate our prompt and we have a flashing cursor ready for us to um, begin work. So let's look at our uh, basic commands here that we need in order to navigate. One is going to be, we have compgen-c. This is going to list, in most Linux distributions, this is going to list all of the possible commands that we might have here. And you will see it is a massive amount. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of commands. So you, of course, can look through that if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen. And just to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to do compgen-c, and then I'm going to pipe that, which this is one of our little tools, so that's a little pipe, and it allows me to redirect the output of one command to the input of another. So I'm going to say I want to take the output of this compgen-c command, and I want to redirect it to the less command. And what I get now is instead of a massive, you know, uh, list of stuff that just automatically gets vomited out onto the screen, I get it a page at a time. So as I hit enter, it continues to add more and more commands. So this is a much easier way for me to look through the commands is by piping it to less. And you can see how useful this is because instead of having to scroll through from the bottom to try to look for what you're looking for here, we can just sort of scroll through here. And there is a command, I think I think I found it right there. This one is going to be very useful to us in just a second. The PWD command. You'll also see kill right there. That's one of the commands we're gonna use later. There's also FG, one that we talked about earlier. There are lots and lots and lots of different commands here that we can look at. We've got apt, you saw that, that was one of the uh, little example commands that I was using. We have user, user delete, that's uh, useful for getting rid of users if you need to. All kinds of stuff on here. So you can search through these and you can see all of the different commands that are available on this particular system. And the cool thing about this is once you know maybe you're interested in a command, let's see how we can learn more about that particular command. So I wanna know what that PWD command does. So let's clear real quick. And let's use the man command. So man is for manual. And it is going to show us the documentation that is available on the system for a particular command. And I saw PWD. And that's an important one. So we're going to do man PWD. And you'll get a page that looks like this. And it will tell you what that command does. This is extremely useful when you have no idea what the command does and how to use it. And they will give you a few interesting things. So first of all, here is the command PWD. And it says we're going to print the name of the current working directory. It gives you a example sort of, uh, and, and these get more confusing the more complex the command is. But basically, you have PWD, which is what you're going to type, and then you will provide some sort of option uh, optionally. So you can just type PWD without an option, but here are some of the options that we have. So we have logical, we have physical, we have help, and we have version, and those are the only available flags that we can use with this command. So 
It also gives you some author and things for reporting bugs and some stuff like that. See also other commands you might want to look at and it will even give you a link to some full documentation. And down here it tells you H for help or Q to quit. We're going to quit. So we're going to type Q. And we're going to use the PWD command. So I'm going to say PWD. PWD will give you the absolute path to where you are at. So the path as a relative file path is just this little tilde symbol and that indicates the home directory of my current user. But when I type PWD, what you see is forward slash home forward slash LWM. And this is the absolute path to where I'm at. So of course forward slash is root, then we have home, and then we have another delimiter there, and then we have LWM. So that is my current working directory. And what we can do is we can see that. So I can type ls and see what's inside the current directory. But if I type cd and dot dot, it takes me back. These are two other commands that are important for us in order to navigate the system. ls is going to list everything that we see here. Right? This every It's the equivalent to dir in the command prompt. ls will show us the files and folders that we have. And you might notice some of these folders look very similar to what you saw in Windows. And of course, CD is exactly as we used it in the command prompt in Windows. And you'll see whenever I did CD dot dot to take me back, remember dot dot is the relative um, um, sort of placeholder for the parent directory or the directory above where you're at. And of course, it takes us into home. And if I do CD dot dot again, you'll see that now I am in the um, root directory, right? And of course, we see all of the folders and everything that we saw last time. Now, in most Linux distributions, what you'll notice here is that there are different little colors. Mostly, um, what you need to know is that blue um, indicates a directory and some other color, like in this case, the swap file there indicates a file. There are some other colors, and you'll even see some highlights and things like that. But we're not going to go into all of them because there are actually quite a few different little color codings and even different systems depending on um, what you're using. But the difference is, is you could use DIR, but DIR leaves them all as the same color. And the color coding is actually very useful. And... Furthermore, ls is a little more versatile. There are some flags we can use like with ls, like um, la for um, basically show me everything. And it will give you more information. And it will also show you any hidden files or folders that exist. This over here is going to show me the... Um, is going to show me the permissions and whether or not it's a directory. So you'll see D at the front if it's a directory. And then you see RWX and different versions of RWX. And basically um, what those are are permissions for different sort of groups. So there's like owner, group, and then other basically. And uh, they're in sets of three. So read, write, and execute. Read, write, and execute. Read, write, and execute. And then we see the file sizes and the last um, date for them to be um, messed with or changed, basically. Okay, so now that we know how to use ls and we know how to use cd, cd is going to take us wherever we need in the command in the command prompt. If I need to go back to my home directory, there are, are oodles of ways to do it, but the easiest way is just type cd and hit enter and it will take you back to your home directory. If I type PWD, and there I am again. Maybe I don't know who the current user is um, for some reason. Um, this There's a command for that that's very good. I mean, uh, normally you'll get a prompt that looks like this, but not in every system. So if I need to know who am I, I type who am I. And in my infinite um, wisdom, it will tell me LWM right there. So now I have a way to figure out where I am and who I am. I know how to list the commands with ls, or I'm sorry, list the files and directories with ls. I know how to change my directory, like to desktop, for example, with cd. And I can effectively move around 
the file system. Now there are a few other things we need to know. For example, with CD, I can specify an absolute file path. Most of the time with CD, like as you see right here, we're using a relative file path, meaning it assumes the current working directory or the um, this one right here and just allows you to change directory from there or we can specify an absolute file path. If I do CD dot dot to go back and I want to go back to desktop but I want to specify specifically what desktop I could do CD forward slash home forward slash LWM forward slash desktop like that. This, this command and this command are the same result in this case. The difference is, is here I'm specifying the full path. This is more useful whenever you're trying to go somewhere that isn't directly attached to where you're at now. So for example, it doesn't make any sense for me to do this whenever I could just type this out because I'm already in a directory that allows me to see desktop. But I can't see something in the Etsy directory in the root, for example. So maybe I would do cd forward slash Etsy like that. And see, it takes me to Etsy. If I type ls, I can see literally all of the stuff in Etsy. There's a huge amount of directories and files in here. And that's because this is where things like configuration files, all the .conf files are configuration files that you may see here. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in Etsy. So now I want to, I'm going to clear, but I want to go back to where I just was. So I'm going to do that file path again. So I'm going to type cd and then we're going to do home and then we're going to do LWM and then desktop like that and see it takes me back so it's not as easy to do the whole uh, relative file path if there is no relative file path to where you're wanting to go so absolute file paths like that one can be very useful all right let's clear that out <clears throat> Now that we know how to navigate around the file system and look at things and, and do different stuff, we're going to use those commands to move around and make some directories, make some files, and we're going to read out those files and do all sorts of things there. Our first command is going to be to make a directory. So let's do this very simple. I'm going to type ls, and you'll see we only have one directory right now inside of our desktop. And I recommend that if you're doing this uh, with me that you do this in your desktop as well because it's just easier to work with um, what's in your desktop. You will probably not have anything in your desktop because I've already created this particular folder here. So to make a folder, we're going to type mkdir. Our argument is going to be the name that we want the folder to be. So we're going to say mkdir my folder. We'll do that, type ls, and you'll see that my folder now exists. To remove the folder, we type rmdir my folder, like that. Type ls, and you'll see that it's no longer there. I'm going to clear the screen. Let's make our screen just a little bit bigger. Now, I need to mkdir my folder. And now inside, I'm going to change to my folder, so cd my folder to go into that folder, type ls, you'll see that the prompt changed, and you'll see when I typed ls, there was nothing in that folder. Let's make a file. I'm going to create an empty file, and we're going to call it file.txt. So you type touch. Touch will create an empty file, and in this case, it's file.txt. I type ls, we now see that it exists. If I go back a directory, and I'm now in desktop, I type ls, I see what I'm looking at, and I want to do rmdir my folder, I run into a problem. It says fail to remove my folder, directory is not empty. So if I have a non-empty directory, rmdir will not work. Let's look at the man page for rmdir, or rmdir. All right, and we have a couple of things. We have ignore fail on non-empty. So it says ignore failure that is solely because a directory is not empty. We have parents, verbose, help, and version. So this is not a particularly useful command whenever you're trying to remove a directory that is full. And so we're going to see here very quickly how to do that. If you want to remove a directory that is full, we use the rm command like we will for files. But we're going to use a couple of flags with it. One of them is 
dash r for recursive which means delete everything in this folder so the folder and all of its contents and all of the folders within its contents and all of it so it deletes everything all right so if i do rm dash r and then my folder now i type ls you'll see my folder and everything is gone and i didn't get an error so it's remember we have in this particular case this is a great command for this we have the um, we have the command itself we have a flag which it changes how this argument or how this uh, command works and then we have an argument that we pass to the command for it to do what it's intended to do all right, so now we know how to make and delete folders if we need to. We saw very quickly how to create a, um, a file. So let's go ahead and make that folder again. So mkdir my folder. I'm going to put all of my stuff in that. So I'm going to cd to my folder. Type ls. You'll see there's nothing in there. I'm going to type touch. And then let's do hello world. Let's see if we can get away with this hello world and then file oops file.txt type ls now you see that didn't quite work like maybe we expected and that's similar to the way we used type last time so I'm gonna go ahead and remove those so if I need to remove all of the files in a folder I can do rm and star and star is a wildcard operator and it means literally anything. So in this case, I deleted everything in that folder with the remove command. So let's try touch a little bit different. So we're gonna do touch file.txt. There we go, it created the file that I wanted. If I try to read that with cat and I do file.txt, you'll see there's nothing in there. Now I could also do other commands for creating files. So if I use echo and I do hello world, I'm going to use another one of those redirects. You saw me use it just a second ago. That is the angle bracket. It's, we call it the right angle bracket. Um, to you it may be the greater than symbol. So we use the right angle bracket and this is going to tell us where to put hello world and I'm going to put that inside of file.txt. So echo hello world inside of file.txt. Now if I didn't do file.txt it would just print out to the uh, console here to the terminal but what I did is I redirected the output to the file. So now if I try to cat file.txt you'll see that it says hello world which is very cool so now we know how to put some text inside of a file we know how to read that text with the simple cat command there are some other things we can do let's say that I want to redirect some output um, to the file so if I do echo and I do goodbye world and I redirect that to file.txt and then I cat file.txt you see that it removed hello world so it overwrote hello world but I don't necessarily want to do that every time so what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna use a little bit different command so if I come to this and I add two right angle brackets that will append now what append means is tack on to the end or add to the end of the file so now if I do that and I cat the file you'll see now it says goodbye world hello world so this redirect right here appends to the end of the file and this one will overwrite so it can be uh, an important difference there type ls again see what we've got I'm gonna clear alright so we've got file.txt we know how to redirect output to a file we know how to redirect and append to the end of a file what about if I need to move or rename the file so to move the file I need to type MV for move I need the argument of the file name and then I need to tell it where I want to move it to so I'm gonna move this to home LWM and let's do downloads 
yeah, downloads. There we go. So I've got move file.txt to home LWM downloads. If I do that, I type ls, you'll see that I no longer have file.txt here. And if I do ls and then specify home LWM forward slash DOW downloads like that, what I'm telling this to do is read from this particular folder downloads here by specifying the absolute path. And I hit enter and you'll see there's file.txt. So it's in that in that folder. It's in downloads in that directory. I want to move it back. So I'm going to type mv, right? And if I do um, forward slash home, forward slash lwm, forward slash, here I'm typing the absolute path to find this file. So file.txt, because I'm not in that directory. I can't use a relative path for that. But if I want to move it to my current directory, I can just hit a period right there. Because period is a um, it, it's a, it's a uh, represent it's a representation of the current directory. So when I did that, and I type ls, you'll see that file.txt has been moved back to our current directory. So it's very cool. You can use dot and dot dot like that. You can use that little star um, as a wildcard operator. Very very useful. Okay. So now we know how to move a file. Let's rename a file with move. So this one's pretty simple. You just type move file.txt and then what do we want to call it? Let's call it new name.txt. Now if I type ls, it's new name.txt. If I cat new name.txt, whoops. Let me clear that. By the way, you see to get out of that, it's control C. I want to cat new name. .txt, and you'll see it still has the same contents, it just has a different name. So we're going to clear that out. There are other ways for us to work with files, including copying a file. So if I want to copy, actually let's move it back to, so let's take new name and make it file.txt again, because I just prefer working with file.txt. So clear, ls, you'll see it's now file.txt again. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do cp for copy. And when we copy, I'm going to do copy file.txt. And here's what it says, missing destination file operand, which means I need to tell it where to copy it to, right? So let's make a copy of file.txt and let's send it to the desktop. Now the desktop is the parent folder to my current folder. So what I'm going to do is just type dot dot because dot dot represents the parent folder to my current folder. So I'm going to do that. If I type ls here, we see that there's file.txt. If I type ls dot dot and we look at the folder above this one, so the desktop folder, you'll see there is file.txt right there. Remember, dot dot or period period is a reference to the parent directory of my current directory and dot, just a single period, is a reference to my current directory. All right, now we know how to copy a file. We know how to move a file around, rename it. Now we need to delete a file. I want to delete that file in desktop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type rm and I'm going to type the path. In this case, I can use a relative path. So I'm going to say dot dot for the parent directory, meaning desktop, and then forward slash, and then the name of the file. And now you'll see that file.txt is still in the folder, still in my folder, but if I do ls dot dot, you'll see it's no longer in the parent folder, which is what we intended to do. All right, so we were able to move all of that stuff around. Now we need to look at some different files and folders here and how we read files and folders. To do that, I'm going to enlist the help of a very cool little website and a very cool little command. So this little command is wget and it stands for webget and what it means is we're, we're I'm going to type in a URL or a uniform resource locator. You know it as a web address most likely. And this web address is going to be to a text file that contains a uh, copy of Moby Dick or the whale. So I'm going to say wget and do www. 
Gutenberg dot org forward slash cache forward slash epub forward slash 2701 and all I'm doing is typing out the exact URL of this file that I want so when I use wget and I hit enter you'll see it downloads that it gives me some information about it downloading it I can type ls and you'll see that file there I'm gonna rename it so I'm gonna say move and then um, that page and we're gonna call this Moby Dick or the whale txt type ls boom there we go all right so if I clear my screen now type ls I have a copy of that if I cat that file we end up with this vomit all over the terminal and you have to scroll way up and I'm gonna tell you you're not gonna get there anytime soon it is a fairly large book here I'm scrolling with the the bar it hey it's so much text right so we need ways to deal with lots and lots and lots of text and so we need something other than cat cat is really great for short files whenever you're messing around with something that isn't horribly large but if you need to there are several different ways that we can handle reading text um, the first one is called head head is for reading the very beginning of a file so if I type um, Moby Dick there now we have the very beginning of the file and in this case it's the first 10 lines of the file if I do the same thing but instead I type tail tail will give me the very end of the file in this case the last 10 lines of the file so that's super useful and then we also have the less command which I believe that I showed you earlier so we type less and this will allow you to go line by line so if you actually wanted to read this this might be the way to read the text file and it's very useful you can see all of the different chapters for this and of course this is all open and free at this point so you can just go through here there are a bunch of chapters in the book and you could literally read this book on the command line like this if you'd like to to get out of it we can just hit Q and that will stop the less command now there are all kinds of flags remember you can type man for example if you wanted to do man tail right there you can get some commands that you can use with it for example tail is really useful whenever you want to read the end of a file that is constantly updating so if you have like a log file this is something I, I do all the time if I have a log file that I want to see update I can do uh, tail dash F and it will allow me to see that update now we've got other commands for example we have nano if I want to edit so I'm gonna type nano and dash L so I can get line numbers and then that file and you'll see now I have the line numbers that I can work with and I can go pretty fast through all of this of course it is a super large text file and of course I can move fairly quickly here as you can see with my uh, arrow keys I'm actually holding control and down while I'm doing this and it's moving me very quickly through the text file there are also some things you can do for example like uh, you can sort of go to line and you can type in the line so if I do like control um, forward slash it'll say enter line number let's see if we have 10,000 lines yeah we have we have more than 10,000 lines so I can go to line 10,000 so if I know the line I can do that um, hit control X that's why I did nano dash L so nano by itself does not add the lines you need to do dash L for the line numbers and I always do dash L because the line numbers are so useful so now that we know how to um, create our files we know how to move around we know how to read those files let's say that we're looking for a file that's a that's one of the things that we might often need to do let's say I don't know where a file is and I type PWD here and you'll see I'm in my home directory and I'm looking for that file.txt so I can use a command called find 
and then I can give it the name of a file. So let's do file.txt. And here's the problem. That doesn't really work, so I need a uh, another little flag to, to use find correctly. So I need find-name, and I'm going to give it the name of the file now. So if I do file-name and then file.txt, it will find it for me. So it says, starting from this directory, the current directory, that's what the dot is for, it gives me the relative file path to where it's at. So it says, starting from where you're at currently, it's in desktop, my folder, file.txt. You'll also see there's another file.txt inside of desktop, my CLI interface uh, folder, and then file.txt. So it finds all of the copies of file.txt. So if you just do this up here, you'll get an error. But if you do it with the flag dash name, you will be able to find that file. There is something else we may look for. So let's go to, if I'm, I'm going to CD and I'm going to go to desktop. Oops, not root desktop, desktop. There we go. And my folder. And we have our copy of that book again. And what I'm going to do this time is use another command. So another ca command we can use to find things is grep. And grep is actually super useful, um, but we can use it to search for terms. So I'm going to search for Moby inside of the book and if I do that it will literally pop up all of the times line by line that that particular word shows up Um, grep can be used for a lot of other things. So one of the things that grep is often used for is, let's see, uh, let's do ls and then forward slash etc. So you see there's a whole bunch of stuff in this directory that can really be ugly to try to work with. And let's say that I'm looking for what we call cron jobs, which are automatically uh, running services, files, things like that that automatically run on uh, Linux that you can set up. And so what we're going to do here is we will clear the screen and I will pipe the commands by giving my little vertical bar delimiter thing there. And I'm going to type ls forward slash etc. And then I'm going to pipe so I'm going to pass the output, what we see on the screen, that output, to grep. And I'm going to look for cron, everywhere that cron shows up. And what you'll see here is it shows me highlighted all of the places that cron shows up in this output. It's actually very, very useful for looking for things, um, especially when you have a lot of output. So that's the simple commands for how we do uh, find things. So we can use grep for finding text and find for finding files. And of course, once you know how to use grep, you can use it very easily to find files and things like that as well um, for what you're looking for. And remember, of course, you can always use that man command, man grep, and it will give you more information on grep, including the different um, ways you can change how the command works. Next, we're going to look at how do we look at disk space. So how much storage we have, what ta what's taking up storage. Um, simplest command for that is called df. And if we do man df here, we'll see that it reports the file system disk space usage. So of course, we're working within our file system, um, and we need to see what's taking up space. Now, the one that we need right here is dash H because we want it to be human readable so that we can read it and not just the computer can read it. So I'm going to type DF dash, dash H and you will see here's what we have got. So we have file systems and basically what you're looking at is there are different little partitions sometimes and we have different things that are in those partitions. Our main partition is right here 
and this is what is actually um, set up as our hard disk. And so you can see that right now our total size is 24 gigs or gigabytes. Um, we've used 11 and that means 13 available and 47% used and then it is mounted on what path? So the mount path is right there in, that's root, just root, right? And of course what you'll see for the other little pieces, the other little mounts, we have um, forward or root run, we have root dev shm, and then we have root run lock, root boot efi, and this right here is actually how uh, you get into the um, like BIOS, nowadays we call it UEFI. But anyway, you'll see most of these are much smaller. Those are megabytes. That's what the M is for, or, or they're using kilobytes, right? But they have megabytes of size. Um, this is probably the largest one that isn't being used. It's 3.9 gigs and it's not using any space. And then we have this one right here um, with 794. But of course the largest one is our actual file system with all of the stuff we're going to store on it right there. And of course this is not horribly large because I'm just running a virtual machine. I gave it a small amount of space um, compared to what my system can actually handle. Okay, so now that we have a way to look at that, we could also look at the the size of the directories and files that we have. So here I am in my home directory for LWM. I'm going to clear this out. If we use du-h, we basically get the same thing. We're going to see all of the different little files and folders that we're dealing with here and approximately how much space they are taking up. And of course, it's very useful to see if you have any large files or folders, something taking up a lot of space. Um, it's a quick little way to use that. Of course, you can string that together with grep if you're looking for something specific. All sorts of different options here. It's impossible to go over all of the different options. I'm just going to sort of give you the toolbox and see how you use it. So that's how we look at disk space and usage. Processes. So these are all of the running processes or running programs that you have on a computer. And of course, in order to do anything, you have to have running programs on your computer. Okay, every time you boot the thing up, you got a program running. The operating system itself is a program. And so we need ways to actually look and work with these processes on the command line. And one of those is to use the ps command. But if you just type ps, um, you really don't get that much. <laughs> There's really nothing uh, going on there. I want to see all of these, so I'm going to add a couple of flags here. We're going to use dash E and dash F, and you'll see, oh, now we've got a lot more stuff going on suddenly. So these are all, as I scroll through this, and remember, we could we could pipe this together. Let's, uh, let's add this with another command. So we know how to use this command, but I want it to be more readable to me. So I'm going to add that and type less. And now I can look at it line by line. So here we go. We've got all these different processes. And you don't have to know what these are doing necessarily. And it, some of it's not even going to make a lot of sense to you. But of course, you can scroll through all of the different processes. And you can see some of what's going on on your computer. And of course, ooh, do you see that right there? So there's LWM. So this is who owns the process. So over here on the left, we have who owns the process. So root is the admin user. We also have some other system level users that um, we don't see, but are actual users on the system. Now they're not users you can typically log in as, but they are users that the system has for doing certain things. So those are all of the ones that I have running. And then we, of course, have root. We have a couple of more that you will see that are working. That's just overload from the other side here. SystemMD, for example. And then in this next column, you will see process ID. That's what PID for is. So we have user ID, process ID, parent process ID. 
And those are those are important because you can see there's always a process tree. There's a parent process that spawns all the other processes. And the cool thing is if you kill the parent process, you kill all of the child processes as well. So it will allow you to shut down something pretty effectively if you need to. Okay. Of course, there's some other information going on here. And this tells you the command that is running that particular process, which is very useful to look through. Now, now that we know the different processes that we have, I'm going to type Q to get out of that. If we had a particular process we wanted to get rid of, we could do that. So let's just take that last command for all the processes and find one. Let's see. See if I can find something. Ooh, there is Bash right there. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kill Bash for a second. So we need the process ID, which is right there. So seven seven five five zero. So I'm gonna type kill seven seven five five zero. Let's see what happens. Let's type ls. Let's look at the process again. Looks like it didn't like that. Let's try a flag this time. Make sure I'm clicked that over here. So this one, I'm going to try kill dash nine seven seven five five. Oops, five five zero. Look at that. Wasn't that cool? All right. So what it did was it killed the terminal, and that's why I chose the that particular process. You don't want to just kill any process, um, especially if you don't know what it's doing. But that killed the terminal that I was in. And so I had to restart it here in order to show you what's going on. So now we know how to kill a process. And that dash 9 was just to force kill it. So whenever I typed it the first time, it wouldn't let me. But whenever I did dash 9, it, of course, would do it while it was running. Now we have one last little process command called top. And this command is very useful to us because it's basically like um, the task manager but for the Linux command line. So if I hit top like this, you will see all kinds of things going on here. So we'll see the process ID, the user who owns it. Um, we see the CPU percentage, memory percentage, the command that's running it, all sorts of information here. Of course, we can look through what's going on and scroll down through the different processes with our arrow keys. And of course, you'll see it stays at the top. And of course, we can look through everything. Of course, there are a lot of different processes going on here. I find top to be very useful, especially whenever you need, maybe there's something running that you need to make sure stops running. And top is super useful for that. Hit control C to get out of that one. All right, finally, we have a few of our commands that are a little more miscellaneous. Um, they do have larger overreaching areas, but I don't really want to get into that on in this basics video. But they are important for you to know about. One of them is sudo. So in Windows, you have an administrator. In Linux, we have root. And one of the ways that you perform a root command is by doing sudo and sudo is stands for super user do and it allows you to become the administrator or root for one command and so one command that you might run is sudo um, apt update and that is because this is to update your computer so you probably need to have a little higher level privileges but if you need to have higher level privileges you use the sudo command for anything. So for example, if I want to become the root user, I would have to type sudo and then su. So I'd have to give myself permission to switch to the root user and it's going to ask me for my password. And now you'll see that my prompt has changed completely. I am now root. I am no longer lwm. I am now root. So the administrator. If I want to exit out of that, I just type exit and it takes me right back. 
So the sudo command for running um, commands. So if it, you ever need uh, higher level permissions, you just type sudo and continue there as long as you are given those permissions in Linux. Uh, a couple of other things we may look at. So if I create a file, and hopefully you remember you can create a file like this. So we do file runme.sh. That is a little different file than a text file. It does contain text if I put text in it, but it could be used to run um, a command, for example. And in order to do that, I have to use the chmod command. The chmod command is for changing the permissions on a file. In this case, I'm going to do plus x on runme.sh. I'll type ls, and you see that it's color changed. It's because I can now run that file. So if I echo to that file, and let's see, no, let's not echo. Let's use nano to edit it. So I'm going to use nano-l runme.sh. And up here at the top, I'm going to do uh, hashtag and then exclamation point. This is called a shebang bin bash. So I'm going to tell it what interpreter to use. In this case, it's going to use the bash shell interpreter. And I'm going to tell it to echo I whoop, but command executed like that. So there's my command. I'm going to save and write that. So I hit control S, control X and hit enter. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the command by doing dot forward slash run me dot sh. And what you'll see is it says command executed. And that would not happen <clears throat> if it didn't have the permission to do so. For example, if I go back up here and I remove its ability to do that, and then I type forward slash run me dot sh, it says permission denied. If I add it back, and then I try to run it, it says command executed. So that's kind of important. There's also a command called chown, and this changes who owns the file or folder, and that can be useful whenever you're working with multiple users. We have another command that I showed you guys earlier, which is wget, and so we've used that before. In fact, let's use our control R, because I don't remember how far back I used that, but I do know I used wget. Let's see, it doesn't seem to find it. So it's probably because I cleared the terminal and whenever I did earlier, whenever I killed that process, it removed all of the stuff. But remember, we can use wget to retrieve a file from the internet, and you saw that earlier. And then our last one is tar. Now you remember, hopefully, uh, zip files from working with um, Windows. But we have .tar files that are typically used in Linux, and of course we have this little tool here. Now that doesn't mean zip files don't exist in Linux and that we can't work with zip files. It just means that lots of times we end up using tar instead of zip whenever we're working with Linux. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a tar file and then we're going to extract it. So uh, make sure that I'm cleared out. I'm going to type ls. I'm going to remove runme.sh. Type ls again, there we go. So now I have my folder. If I ls my folder, I can see what's in there. And I, I don't like that the book is taking up so much space. So we're just gonna compress that entire, entire folder and everything into an archive. So I'm gonna type tar. But I realize I don't really know how to make an archive with tar. So I might type in man and then tar, like we've done before. And we're going to use the dash C flag for create. And the next a dash X flag is for extract. So C is to create the archive. X is to extract. We've got a couple of other things that we're going to throw in there. They're a little further down here. You'll see there's the dash C for create. We are going to also add in, let's see if they've got them up here. They don't. They're going to be a little further down. We're going to add the dash V. You may have to look pretty far sometimes um, whenever you scroll down for stuff. Anyway, I'll just tell you because it's going to be a little bit to go through this. So what we're going to do is we're going to type tar. 
and then we're going to do dash C. Now, I don't have to do dash a different one. I could do dash, you know, dash V and dash F, but that, that's kind of ugly. So I can add them all together. So what I'm going to do is dash V so that it tells me what it's doing every time. That's really important. Um, I want it to be verbose, and that's what V is for. Verbose means, if someone's verbose, it means they talk a lot or they use more words than necessary. So verbose in this case means I want it to tell me as much as it can. All right. F is so that I can specify the type of file, and I'm going to add one more, which is Z, so that we can press the file into a gzip. So I have C, V, F, Z, those are my flags to change how tar works. And then I'm going to tell it um, what I want the archive to be named. In this case, I'm going to call it my folder.tar.gz. And this is how we usually do this. And then we'll have my folder just like that. And let's see what it says. So it says um, no such. Um, file or directory. And it's added Z for some reason. Let me let me remove this real quick and see what I have done wrong. All right, so the issue was is that I have added Z in the wrong spot here. Um, Z needs to go up here. I realized what I've done. What I did is I said, because I added F right here, so if I move my cursor over there, because F is right there, I've told it that the file is Z, and that is not what I should have done. I should have put a Z before that to prevent that issue. So all we're going to do here is move Z to before that, and we can use our little um, control uh, T there to switch those two and hit enter again, and this time it works. So it's just that I put the, the F should be at the end, and um, the other order doesn't really matter that much. So now if I t type ls, you'll see that in red we have a compressed folder. And remember we can use du-h and see what we've got here. We'll clear that out. Now that we see that little um, compressed folder that we have, we can look at extracting it. So it's pretty much the same command as we use to create it, right? Except I don't need the name of the folder at the end. And instead of a C, it's just an X. So now if I do that, it actually makes my folder. Now you can't really tell the difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do rm r my folder and get rid of it, show you that it's not there. So now that now we see that it's not there, I'm going to go and extract again, type ls, and you'll see it's back. All right, and that pretty much covers the basics of working around in Linux and what you can do with it. Um, there are a mountain more commands and a lot more to learn, but this covers the basic things you might need to know to move around and work with Linux and really get started in using this excellent tool. With that, I thank you for watching Learning with Merit.